evening, everybody, and happy Earth yeah. Day. My name is Chelsea Khan, and I'm also with the University of Washington Engage program. Uh, I'm currently writing my thesis and doing my research on climate change communication, and I'm specifically looking at how journalists in South Asia communicate about these issues. Um, as you can tell, my subject is quite specific, as are most other graduate student studies. So we, um, myself and many of the other students, are lucky enough to be part of the ENGAGE program. And this provides a unique and interesting way for us to learn how to communicate about our science in exciting, engaging ways. Um, and if you'd like to learn some more, you can visit our website at engage-science.com. And tonight, I'm lucky enough to present our second speaker, Brooke Castle, sticking with the theme of fire. Um, prior to graduate school, uh, Brooke enjoyed studying in the forest on her free time, but now it's her job. And she's had an array of jobs before this, being a co-owner of a mushroom farm, and she is a musician as well. But tonight, she's going to talk to you about her work. Currently a PhD student in the University of Washington's Wildfire Sciences Laboratory, Brooke studies forest ecology and wildfire. And she'll be talking to you about fighting fire with fire, balancing human safety and healthy forests. Please give a warm welcome to Brooke. As Chelsea said, I'm a student at the University of Washington and I study fire. And most of the time when people hear that I study fire, their first reaction is, cool. <laughs> and I agree, it's cool. Um, it is a really interesting topic, but you know the second thing that people ask me is, well, what exactly is there to study about fire? I mean, it burns through forests, they, they regrow, so what? Um, so some of the things that I'm really interested in, in looking with, at fire, is how often they've happened in forests through time, which is what I'm doing right here. I was I, lucky enough to be able to go to Mexico for my master's, and look at tree rings to determine how often fires happen through time. So I kind of not only got to put on my ecologist goggles, but also my detective hat. Um, some of the other things that we look at with fire are what grows back after fires. Um, and also, you know, we're humans and we live in a world that has fire. So how can we balance human safety in areas where fires might burn, but also allow those really important fires to burn in forests? And I think this is a really important question, but it took me a while to get to it. So I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to be so interested in fire, and I hope that you will be just as interested as I am. So let me take you back to 2005. I was living in Chicago, and I was working in a desk job, and I have never even considered being a scientist. And one day, Katrina, the hurricane, hit New Orleans. And a lot of the city was flooded, and this hit me really hard because this was a city that I was in love with. I've been going to New Orleans since I was 18, and I love the food and the culture. Um, I just love this city, and to have it so devastated after this natural disaster was a really painful thing. I thought to myself, well, maybe you know, this maybe this means something. Maybe I need to figure out a way that I can make a difference. But I didn't really know how or what it meant. And I started to see headlines like this one, Katrina damage blamed on wetlands loss. And this one, restoring wetlands key to avoiding another Katrina. Well, what in the world could that mean? What could wetlands have to do with a hurricane hitting the land? If the hurricane hits, what's the, dif what's the difference that the wetlands are going to make? But what I realized after doing more reading is that as we humans, we multiply and we move out into natural areas and we develop them, and sometimes, when we develop natural areas, nature decides to teach us a lesson. <laughs> Maybe we didn't make the right decisions. And as it turns out, that when we poured concrete all over these wetlands to develop, what we did was we took away that sponge that would have absorbed a lot of the water that was coming in. And you might be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with fire? We shall see. So at this point, I quit my job. I said, this is way too important for me to, to be staying in this job, so I'm gonna quit my job, and I hopped on a plane, and I flew out to Seattle, and I joined the University of Washington. And one of the things that I started studying is something that's called the Wildland Urban Interface, and I wanted to tell you about this because it's a theme that I'm gonna be bringing up throughout this talk. The Wildland Urban Interface is just a natural extension of humans as we as we grow, our populations grow, and we start to leave urban areas, and we start moving out into the wilderness. 
And the wildland urban interface can be anything from a suburb that is just on the edge of some forested land all the way out to vacation homes and cabins that are located out in the woods. So again, as we humans are multiplying and we, we just want to move into nice areas, sometimes we don't realize that we might actually be putting ourselves at risk. So how can we balance having healthy forests and healthy ecosystems, but also being able to live in a safe place? Now, speaking of safe, Emily told us about something called crown fires. When we have homes that are located in the wildland urban interface, those wildfires can sometimes come down the hills, come down out of the forest and into our neighborhoods. Well, this is not something that we like, clearly. Um, we need to be able to live in safe places and not be worried about our homes burning down. So you may be asking yourself, well, this looks pretty familiar. This is actually a picture from Colorado Springs from a fire that burned through in just 2012. So this is a problem that we're having in the current day. But really, this story goes all the way back to 1910. There was a huge fire in 1910. It was actually the biggest fire in our country's history. Over two days, over three million acres were burned across Montana, Idaho, and Washington. And it was devastating. Entire towns were burned to the ground. This is Wallace, Idaho in this picture. Almost completely burned to the ground. Over 80 people lost their lives. And these pictures are looking pretty similar to this picture from Katrina, right? This is a big natural disaster. And it also results directly from us living in a natural system where natural disasters occur. Um, and in addition to losing structures and homes in the communities, we also lost sources of income, like timber, because we also had forests that were burned. Well, as a society, we decided, that's it, fire. You've had it. You are the villain. And we're just not going to have any more of you, so we're going to put fires out completely. And shortly after the Big Burn, we passed the Weeks Act. And the Weeks Act uh, set some guidelines for how we would try and suppress or put out as many fires as we possibly could, even if they were way out in the wilderness. And just a few la years later, in 1935, we passed a policy that was called the 10 a.m. policy. Now, I love this policy because it's, it's so human. We decided that we are going to put out all fires by 10 a.m the day after we find out about them. <laughs> That's right, 10 a.m. the next day. And if we can't get it out by 10 a.m., we're gonna come back the next day and we're gonna get it out by 10 a.m. the next day and so on and so forth. Well, as you can imagine, it doesn't really work that way. Nature often makes its own decisions. But to, uh, to further this campaign of, of really trying to make fire suppression the way it is, um, an anti-fire campaign that you're probably familiar with was started, and this is the longest-running, most successful PSA campaign in the history of our country, Smokey the Bear. And he is a cute little guy. Our new Smokey from 2013 is a little buffer. <laughs> he still has the same message, which is it's our job to prevent forest fires, and Smokey has done a lot of good. Um, of course, we want to put out our campfires. We don't want to start fires accidentally. But what the Smokey the Bear campaign really has done is it's reinstilled this idea that fire is the villain. It doesn't allow the idea that fire actually might be a good part of the ecosystem. And so as a society, we've generally decided that fire is a bad thing and we're going to get rid of it. But there are some downsides to fire suppression. One of these is simply money. So over the past couple of decades, the money that our government spends on fire suppression is over $3 billion a year. That's a lot of money, but well worth it if it's getting the job done, right? Perhaps even more seriously, every single year we lose about 8 to 30 firefighters who are fighting wildland fires. So it stands to reason that we, we might want to consider prioritizing which fires we're trying to put out, especially considering the fact that they are so dangerous. And we also might want to consider, is there another way for us to spend a portion of that $3 billion um, in ways that might be more effective? So again, with the wildland urban interface, we're still having fires. So even though we're pumping so much money into trying to put them out, we are still having these very big catastrophic fires in the wildland urban interface. Again, if we take fire out of the ecosystem, we will lose some of those benefits that Emily have, has already told us about. One of those is the fire pulse. 
And depending on what ecosystem you're talking about, a small or a very large fire might be needed in order to create that fire pulse where you get this influx of new growth where it sort of resets the forest ecosystem. Um, another benefit, just as a, a quick review that she talked about, was this idea of a landscape patchwork. So having maybe a really big fire in one area of the landscape, and maybe keeping fires small in other areas of the landscape will increase biodiversity and allow us to have habitat for different kinds of wildlife across the landscape. But again, we probably don't want those really big fires in our neighborhoods in the wildland urban interface where it can really impact human safety. So, what can we do about it? Um, the last benefit of fire that I want to talk about, and this is the one that I'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk, is the idea that we can actually prevent future fire danger by using fire. And this might seem really counterintuitive. How could you make something safer by using fire? Well, in order to understand this concept, there's something else that I want to talk about, and I will come back to this picture, which I just had to show you because it's also in Mexico, and it's a really great forest. And you know, when I look at it, I think, why would we want any fire in this forest? It's perfect the way it is. But you will shortly see. So take this forest, for instance. You have two trees pretty close together. You can see that the, the foliage of those trees is actually touching each other. And then one more tree that's off to the side. Now let's imagine that lightning strikes and it starts this first tree on fire. Now, as you can tell, that tree that's right next to it is, is close enough that that fire is going to have absolutely no trouble moving from one tree to the other. But that third tree is so far away, there's enough space there that as that fire burns down that second tree, it's probably just going to go out. And it's, it's not going to have anywhere to go. So you had the potential for a really big fire, it goes out, problem solved, no problem, it stays small. But what if you have a whole bunch of shrubs or bushes that are connecting, in a way, that first group of trees with your third tree over there? Well, the fire is going to have no problem, right? It's just going to move continuously down that second tree. It's going to light those shrubs on fire. And then it's going to move right up that third, that third tree. So this is what we call fire spread. And in order for fire to spread, it generally has to have continuous fuels. And fuels are anything that can light on fire. So just like, you know, if you light a campfire, you can put paper in, you can put small pieces of wood, you can put big pieces of wood, anything that burns, we're just gonna call that fuel. So you can think of fire spread like a set of dominoes. You set dominoes up, as long as they're close enough together, one falls, they're all going to fall right in a row. But what happens if one of those dominoes is set further apart, just like that last tree was? Well, this little girl is about to find out. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so bad for her when I did that. <laughs> but again, I just want to drive that point home. If the fuels are spread far apart, just like that domino, that fire just has no place to go. So, Back to our beautiful forest in Mexico, if you look on the right hand side, this is an experimental area where disturbances have been allowed. In this case, it's mostly been cattle grazing, but fire could also be the disturbance that could have gone through this area. And as you can tell, the trees are pretty widely spaced, there's not a lot of fuels connecting anything. So if you have a fire in that area, well, it's not going to be any problem. It's going to be very small, probably not even going to kill those trees, but over on the other side of the fence, that has been, um, there, there have been no fires in that area for 30 years. And that's all it took for that forest to go from wide open pine trees to this lush tropical vegetation. If that fire went from one side to the other, it would just right up into the grounds. And it would most likely kill everything and probably be pretty devastating to that ecosystem. So to bring it back to Washington and the Pacific Northwest, the picture on your left is a historic uh, version of the pine forest that we have on the east side of the Cascades. If you've ever gone hiking over there, you might recognize some of those trees of nice big pine trees. They're beautiful. And pre-European settlement, there used to be fires in that area every 7 to 15 years. So it cleared out all of that underbrush, kept those trees really widely spaced. And those trees were what we call adapted to fire. So they could survive fires without any trouble. Um, now, if you were to have a fire, it would probably look something like this. 
pretty close to the ground, just fill up the grasses and the shrubs. Not a big deal. But if you look at the modern forest on the right hand side, this is directly a result of us putting out those fires, deciding that fire was the enemy and that we had to put them all out. When we put out fire, those trees sort of grow a little closer together, we get more shrubs, those fuels become continuous, almost like a ladder. When the fire can jump from the very base all the way up into the tree very easily. And so if we have a fire in this forest, it's probably gonna look more like this. A raging crown fire that is probably gonna kill all of those trees, where a small fire would let most of those trees live. So one of the things that we can do, and, and this addresses one of the questions from Emily's talk, is we can go into the forest and we can thin it. And this is one of the ways that we might consider taking some of that $3 billion that we're using every year to fight fires and use it before the fire even happens. So if you see this kind of a forest when you're walking on a hike, it doesn't really look that pretty, right? It looks pretty messy, but you can think to yourself, well, what we've done here is we're proactively going in and clearing out some of those fuels so that if a fire does happen in this area, it's not gonna have any place to spread. The domino is just gonna fall and nothing else is gonna happen. So I wanna tell you a little story about how we know that this works. So a few years ago, I was on a research team out in Arizona and there had been a fire out there in 2011. But luckily before the fire, the Forest Service and the community had decided to do some experiments and find out if these thinning treatments really work. So they had put in a bunch of thinning treatments. They had thinned a lot of the forest around the communities. Well, the fire came through, um, as fires will do in Arizona, especially when you have a hot and dry year. So after the fire, we waited a year, and then we went out there to take measurements and see if the thinning treatments had actually done what, what we hoped that they would do. So, I'm up there with a, with a group um, of, you know, we're all wearing hard hats, we've got our orange vests on, and we're all sweaty because it's about 100 degrees out that day. And we're way up on this big hill. And I look down and I see this man, and he's just trucking his way up the hill. And I can kind of see his very nice house all nestled in the woods down below. And, you know, we weren't sure if he was going to be cranky because we were kind of in his backyard, even though we were on the other side of the fence. We didn't know what he was going to say, but so he, trucks it up the hill and he's out, you know, he's out of breath, catches his breath for a second, and he just says, hey, I just wanted to come up here and tell you guys thank you so much for saving my house. And it worked. The thinning treatments worked. The fire came down the mountain through the thick forest. It hit those thinning treatments and it dropped to the ground and then it went out. And it didn't make it to their community. And in fact, all of the houses in that community were saved. And there were houses in other areas. There were about 37 structure, structures, I believe it was, that were burned in that fire. But in this area where the thinnings had happened, not a single burnt building was burned. So it does work. So back to our thin forest here. You might be thinking to yourself, well, what are you going to do with all that debris? I mean, there's a lot of wood just kind of laying on the ground. Do you let it decompose? And the answer is sometimes we might leave it on the ground. Um, it depends on what kind of forest you're in. You might also be asking yourself, well, wait a second, we've been hearing a lot about these fuels. Isn't that a fire risk to leave all that fuel on the ground? And the answer is again, sometimes, you know, ecology is always complicated. <laughs> but in some cases, it might be a fire risk, especially if we're expecting a dry year, or if it's in an area where we suspect we might get fire pretty regularly. So, there's a solution. We can pile up all of that debris into piles, and you might have seen these as you're hiking through the woods, especially on the east side of the Cascades, where these mysterious piles just piled up in, in clearings. And this is the first way that we get to fight fire with fire. We wait till it snows, or until it rains quite a bit, and then we light them on fire. So in this way, we're introducing fire in a very small way into small areas where we do open up space and allow new growth but it's pretty small. It doesn't create a lot of smoke and it really doesn't scar the soil in too large of an area. It's pretty small. The other way that we can fight fire with fire is using prescribed fire. So by now, you knew this was coming. Um, so with prescribed fire, this is a way that we can introduce fire into these forests, minimize future fire risk by clearing out a lot of those understory fuels and those continuous fuels that might bring the fire up into the canopy. And we can 
can do it in such a way that we minimize the smoke that we produce. So to minimize air quality issues for community while also improving the safety of the community. And I was lucky enough to be able to take a wildland firefighting course last year where I learned how to do this and I thought you guys might be interested in hearing about how we start the fires, which is amazing because we just have a canister of gasoline or another lighter fluid, and there's a little wick at the end, and we light it on fire, and we just walk and drip liquid fire. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty amazing. Um, not the safest thing for the firefighters, but they're well trained. Do not try this at home. So I want to show you an example of what a prescribed fire looks like, just to give you an idea of what you might experience if you have one done in your community. So again, it's pretty small. These are really well-planned fires. Agencies can spend up to four years determining when is the best time of year for that ecosystem, going in and defending the trees, making it as safe as they possibly can, and then deciding on the day that the smoke, you'll notice the smoke is staying Seattle. If we're going to grow, we are. 
how can we better balance human safety and still have healthy ecosystems and also allow those disturbances that are so natural in our ecosystems. So one, one of the ways that science has shown us that we can balance human safety and healthy forests is by fighting fire with fire. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to Town Hall for providing this menu for the Engaged Speaker Series for helping us learn how to communicate our science to the public to the UW programs and to the International Association of Wildland Fire. And I'd be very happy to take your questions.